Hey everybody, Wayne here. In today's overview and review, I'm taking a look at Point Blank, V is for Victory, designed by Sean Drulinger and published by Lock and Load Publishing. Thank you to Lock and Load for sending me a copy to review and show, show off to you guys. I already have a recon, I have a partial gameplay um, video up, um, and then obviously this is my overview and review. So um, Point Blank is a two player and solitaire. It comes with a full solitaire bot um, with nice handy flow charts, double sided. Um, that is, it's a tactical scale card based war game. Um, this is a game that is similar to, or based on the lock and load tactical system, which is a hex encounter system. Obviously this one is card based. Um, I'm going to go ahead and do a quick overview. Um, like I said, I already have, you know, a partial playthrough gameplay video. I'll cover my pros and cons, and then I'll wrap up with my final thoughts. All right. As I said before, this is obviously a card game, card driven card game. Um, we can look at a couple different things here. So first off, terrain card. So there is this map. The game comes with this like play mat. Don't look at it as a map so much as a play a play mat, uh, as opposed to map. Um, the map itself is really these terrain cards, right? So technically, you can play with little counters. Um, designating kind of the outside areas. Each one of these little areas is a sector, and then the sectors here are grouped together. See where there's like a letter D, C, A, B? Those are areas. So areas are gonna be the vertical, horizontal, doesn't really have a name, but each little area is a sector. You can either use this mat, or you can use the chits to sort of mark off the boundaries. Um, either way, it takes up a substantial amount of uh, real estate. You can use these chits because the counters, or excuse me, the cards themselves, you can see, still take up a lot of space themselves the way they sit. Um, speaking of cards, like I said, terrain cards are kind of the key. So each of these sectors, you're going to be drawing and or placing a terrain card. It's going to, very simple, it's going to tell you what it is. Clear the bridge, which just is actually a um, victory objective. Road, wood, stone building, etc., it's going to have a defensive modifier in the bottom right of the card. Nice big number there. And it's going to tell you something like, say it's a blocking terrain like woods are, totally blocks line of sight. Brush, um, just obscuring terrain, partially blocks line of sight. Um, every unit is going to have to be in some sort of terrain. Again, you're drawing, placing, or if you're able to get a chance to have them yourself in your hand, you may be able to place them. Um, when it comes to the units themselves, the game comes with infantry and AFEs, armored fighting vehicles, as well as smaller cards, which are going to be leaders or support weapons. The infantry, along with the um, tanks and such, the armored fighting vehicles, very simple. You can see the name of it here. Top right is going to be, um, if anything, it contributes towards a victory objective. For instance, victory objective is the bridge. You have to have two white flags, one black flag, on which the black flags are going to be on, say, this tank here. So it contributes one white flag. Top left is the um, actual um, side. So you, this is the United States Infantry. The little icons, I'm not gonna explain all of them. Those are the action icons. Tells you you can do things like move, fire, throw smoke. Um, special abilities, this has plentiful ammo so it doesn't run out of ammo. US was well supplied. The blue number is morale. And the red number is gonna be their firepower. And then the, the smaller number up right next to it is gonna be the range. Then you're going to have, like I said, smaller um, cards. For instance, the leader here, his morale, his leadership ability, his name, who he belongs to. And then you can see you can go ahead and spend him, which is the tap, the equivalent of tap, although that is a copyrighted phrase, um, for, you know, different actions that he can take advantage of. Um, you have things like support weapons, machine gun, you know, it would be stacked with an infantry. You can go ahead and add his firepower with them. Different ranges, things like that can make them more effective. This tank, M4A1 Sherman, you know, you have his uh, morale, you have what's called ordnance firepower. So you have regular firepower, there's red numbers, and you have ordnance here, which is firing at either other AFVs, or you can technically fire the ordnance at infantry <laughs> if you're particularly evil. Um, I mentioned leader support cards. The other big thing that really kind of guides the game is the action cards. So besides the terrain, besides the units, you have a hand of action cards. You're generally going to have five of them. The bot has none. Bot just plays off the um, flow charts, as I mentioned. But you will have these action cards. And what you're going to be doing is you're going to be playing them one a turn, one per impulse. Not a turn, I should say. One per impulse. That allows you to conduct an action, and you're going to assign that action to a unit or a stack. For instance, 
the arrow is a move. You can go ahead and sign it to say a move. And it'd be one unit. Basically, you're assigning it to that sector. So if you have multiple units in a sector, they can you can get a better advantage out of a, um, a single action. Grenade here, that's an assault, which is you can do a move and a fire action. Little explosion, that's just a fire action, etc. You get the idea. One thing you may have noticed is in the top right, you have numbers. Those replace dice. Game comes with two dice for the bot. However, when it comes to resolving actions, drawing for the rolls, you're basically drawing card from the action deck for these numbers. Even if you decide to use a dice, make sure you draw from the action card. Because it's interesting part of the game is that this action deck is the timer for the turn. You are running through this action deck once you have resolved the last card or drawn and discarded it. That turn is over, goes on to the next turn. So what is a turn? Or I should say what's in the phases that end up making up a turn, right? So basically we have an upkeep phase. And what's interesting about this game is the upkeep phase, and I'll run kind of run through it quick. You're resolving your melee and overrun attacks that were declared the previous impulse. Because it goes impulse, basically goes upkeep, impulse, then each side, right? So Americans upkeep impulse, Germans upkeep impulse, Americans upkeep impulse, etc. back and forth until all the cards are, are gone from the action deck, and then at the turn end phase. So during the impulse phase, that's when you're playing their cards, right? So you're playing your fire, your move, your rallying, etc. Well, a couple of things, movement and then resolving melee and overrun, those are handled the next, your next upkeep phase. So for example, you might say, okay, I'm giving this move, I'm declaring this move on my infantry squad here. You would go ahead and play a movement, chit, facing the way you're gonna move, say we're gonna move into that stone building there. He also would get a fatigue because he's an infantry for moving. Okay, now that's the end of your impulse. You played a card, you're pretty much good. It goes to the Germans, the Germans do their upkeep, their impulse. Then it comes back to your upkeep. Now you resolve that movement. In this case, you would simply move him. You already have a building there or a terrain, so you don't need that card anymore. It would be discarded. So you go ahead, flip the moving over to spotted, place it on the terrain to show that he's spotted because he moves, so he's spotted. And then the fatigue stays with him, and you have one fatigue until it is, um, until it is removed. So interesting how that movement, and then also, like I said, melee and overrun, which melee is with infantry, moving in to attack and then over one is when you have armored fighting vehicles moving into the same sector and attacking play is going to kind of go back and forth like that um you know you're running through that sequence of play again upkeep phase impulse phase each side goes back and forth card 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 or when you're playing a bot you play card the bot rolls and acts the flow chart you play a card etc back and forth till you run through the deck run through the turns Generally, a scenario, for instance, may say, okay, capture the bridge, right? You remember you have to have enough of those flags. So two white flags and one black flag. All right, so, <clears throat> excuse me, a little cough there. I had to pause the video. So even though you have, say, the American infantry here, that's not enough to, to actually take control of it. He just occupies it. You need another infantry and then your old Sherman buddy to move in. Um, play proceeds like that back and forth until you have a victor. So I think it's enough for an overview. Again, I have a partial playthrough. I mean, you can actually see some of the... Um, procedures, some of the <clears throat> aspects of the game in action. This is my apologies. Um, let's, so let's go ahead, wrap that up. And then there's other, many other videos, many other excellent videos from the designer, from Devin over at Lock and Load, um, Tony's Board Life. He has some videos. You can watch them if you want to see the game in action. Otherwise, let's go to my pros and cons. And of course, my final thoughts. All right, pros and cons. Cons first as always, then my pros. First con, the game... It's intimidating at first glance. The rule book is around 90 pages. Not all rules, but it is still 90 pages long. It is a very thick, very big rule book. Text is large, lots of pictures, lots of example. It's still a long rule book. Um, the game comes with hundreds and hundreds of cards. <clears throat> you can see a bunch of them here. There's piles all over the place over here. This is a lot of cards. Now, you know, when you start open the box, you start organizing the cards, you're reading through the rule book. There's a little bit of a feeling of where do I start? And once you do start, you're going to be constantly referring back to the rule book, shuffling through the player aid cards, you know, while you're learning the system. And you won't learn it quickly. It's going to take time. This is not the game that you set up, learn, and play in an afternoon. The rule book is good, but far from perfect. A couple examples, for instance, um, fire combat. It's explained in detail, including how to resolve it under section 8.0, 
the action section of the rulebook. Actions, and then fire. You can see there's a big page jump there because it takes five pages, explains everything. Okay, fantastic. Now, say you want to do melee overrun, right? So look at melee overrun in that section right here. Oh, wait, it's only like half a page long, right? Because even though fire is explained in the action section, the melee overrun is not. You have to go to 7.0 game functions and find melee overrun to find out how to actually resolve it. Now, you may think, well, Wayne, especially if you understand the mechanics, maybe is that because melee is resolved in your next upkeep phase like movement is, right? Whereas fire is instantaneous. That would make sense. However, something like movement is explained in detail under 8.0 here, under the movement, move, see, 60, 60, 69, three pages. They explain movement in detail here. So why isn't melee overrun covered in this section? You know, it's not a bad rulebook by any means. It just makes learning the game a little harder than necessary. And there may be some information missing off a of player aid card here or there as well. Uh, example is under the recon action on the um, player aid, it lists one thing you can do. Well, in reality, you actually have three distinct actions you can take with a recon action. So just be mindful that the player aid cards, as though they're great, you know, mnemonics and reminders, they may not be entirely accurate. Uh, my second con, the play area. It's large, larger than I expected. This is not the game that's going to fit on a small table or even comfortably fit on a medium-sized table. And because the battlefield shape is rectangle and it's designed so each player sits on the shorter edge of that rectangle, that means that when you're playing solitaire, you're reaching a long way to move enemy units, right? If you have the full map set up. This is kind of a cheat setup. This isn't like an accurate setup. This, this map is going to stretch. I watched a playthrough video where the game is being played solitaire and the poor guy, and I'm not going to name names, he had to stand and stretch over the table just to reach the other side. You know, not exactly my idea of a fun, relaxing, solitary experience. Now, I have kind of figured out a solution that I'm comfortable with, and that's playing with the battlefield sideways. Which, if you watch my gameplay vid, you'll see that. I have everything set up this way, right? Sideways, not up and down. That way you can sit on the long edge of the rectangle like you can with most war games. It does mean the cards technically aren't facing with their top edge, you know, toward the enemy which is how the rules tell you to set it up, but it doesn't really change any actual part of the gameplay. So kind of an obvious but easy solution for me when I'm playing solitaire. Third, line of sight. Oh man. There are procedures and systems in this game design that I questioned at first, but once I played a bunch, it came around and really started to appreciate. Movement is an example, which I will talk about more in my pros. But line of sight in this game, it's tough. First off, to be perfectly honest, I'm not sure this game even needs line of sight rules, period. It's a card game with an abstracted game board made up of terrain cards. It does come with this paper map, like I mentioned, so you can put down, um, put them on and play on to kind of assist you, especially when you start. But it's just a guide to show you how the battlefield is made up. What really matters, all that matters, is those abstracted sectors of terrain with the terrain cards. And the battlefield, you know, being divided up with these columns called areas. I'll stop there. I'm not trying to teach you the game from this review. My point is, why are we worrying about line of sight so much in a card game? You're already abstracting so many aspects. If you really insist on having line of sight in your card game, since Point Blank is so tied to lock and load tactical, you know, I get that they kind of wanted to include that. They want to make it more realistic. Why such a complicated line of sight system? I watched a video from Devin at Lock and Load, and no offense, because love Devin, and he clearly knows the game, knows it far better than I do. He, he was struggling to explain line of sight easily. And the guy probably knows the game as well as anyone on earth. You know, the guy's probably played it dozens, if not hundreds of hours. And I'm not trying to call you out again. Sorry, Devin. Um, I just want to use you as an example. Here is someone who works for Lock and Load, who knows the system. And even he kind of struggled with line of sight. He knows it, but it took him kind of a second. You could tell he was kind of a little bit of a hitch in his, his step, right, as he's trying to explain it. The line of sight system in this game is complex. But unlike the combat and movement systems... It doesn't seem to add enough to the gameplay experience or simulation aspect to really make it worthwhile. Okay, enough of my cons. Let's get to some pros. What an epic game Lock and Load has produced. The artwork, it's evocative of the history, yet it blends well with the necessary gameplay elements like the icons on the action cards and unit cards. You know, just look, I mean, look at this. Look at that beautiful artwork. Icons are clear, easy to read. You can absolutely see everything you need to see here. 
this infantry. Nice clear artwork. You're seeing what it is. You get the flavor. Unit icons. Nice clear numbers for morale, for firepower, etc. You know, speaking of the icons, although there is a lot of iconography, you know, like especially an armored car, right? Like a, a uh, excuse me, armored fighting vehicle. Look at all the icons on there. But it just works, right? I mean, it's never too much information. They're clear and easy to read. Once you know what these mean, I never had a problem identifying or reading it at a glance, even from far away. The cards, like I said, they're easy to read. You know, and what I also love is the fact that the leader and the support weapon cards are all mini sized, right? So the main cards are like standard slash poker sized. But because the other cards are mini sized, it means even with a leader or support weapon stacked on a unit, you can read everything you need to read, right? Like look at this infantry squad. Yes, it covers up the beautiful artwork, but boom, you put that support weapon there. You can still see, you not only see the information for the support weapon, you can still see that actual infantry unit's morale, his firepower, what actions he can take, everything that you need for the gameplay. You know, that's a tremendous quality of life achievement for a game that is so heavy, filled with numbers and icons, you know? The play read cards, I like them. They're a tad busy at first glance, but at least they include a lot of the information that's needed. So it is appreciated. Second, the solitaire bot, which they call an artificial enemy opponent, maybe a little bit of a too big of a name. So I'll just call it a bot, by the way. Um, it's very well done. You know, it saves all of us time. Now, the game comes with multiple player aid card flowcharts to manage the bot. You know, I mentioned them before, right? So what happens is you have here, depending on whether it's a defensive or attack posture, you're going to roll dice. It's going to tell you basically the action slash chart. You go to that chart and then you're going to follow the flow chart. The bot operates under different rules for unit activation than a human player opponent would. You know, as I described in my overview, as a human player, you know, using the action cards to drive what actions you take with your units, which they also act as the turn timer. With the bot, he rolls those two dice, checks the flow chart. You simply discard, discard the top card of the action card deck during each of his impulses to keep the turn kind of system going. At first glance, I was worried by abandoning the action card system for the bot. It wouldn't have the same feel. But I was pleasantly surprised to find out I was worried over nothing. The flow charts, well, taking an extra few seconds to roll and look up and determine what the bot's going to do, as opposed to simply playing a card. They still do an excellent job of examining the tactical situation on the map and responding accordingly. You may disagree with the decision here or there, but Lock and Load recommends, and I agree, to let the bot play the opponent as it wants and see what happens. You may be surprised in the long run how challenging of an opponent the bot turns out to be. Overall, I think the bot is fantastic. Kudos to Sean and the rest of the team at Lock and Load for including with the game. I think I'd speak for many of us solitaire war gamers when I say we appreciate them creating a bot in the first place and appreciate even more that it's included in the base game, not some expansion. Another pro, I love how the different actions are handled in different ways. I kind of mentioned this a little bit in my cons. The most obvious example is how movement and melee, which it's really tied into movement, right? Because you're moving into the adjacent sector to conduct melee. Um, it's a delayed process. So let's compare in the case of something like fire, so you're firing this infantry squad at that infantry squad, it's declared and resolved immediately. Pretty standard for a game, right? Like you're, hey, I'm gonna fire at him, you resolve it, done. However, with movement and the related actions like melee and overrun combat, you declare it by placing the marker. I mentioned, I showed it before, put that movement marker, but it's not resolved until your next impulse. That shows that while something like pulling a trigger may occur relatively immediately, it takes time for units to move across terrain. You know, that allows the enemy to react. They see movement. You're not immediately teleported to where you need to be, right? It takes time to get there. So it allows the enemy to react. They can shoot at you, which they're going to get a bonus. They could try to move, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. It's a clever mechanic. Works very well. Also really like the combat system. It's a little procedure heavy. And maybe the steps to resolving it could have been reduced a little bit. But really, I can't complain. I like how the infantry and the ordnance firepowers are separate. I love that you can put support weapons on squads of soldiers and it doesn't replace their normal weapons. It just adds to them, you know, and I like that fire combat is immediate, you know, as I mentioned when talking about movement, something like melee combat, which relies on movement is delayed until your next impulse. Overall though, all these things work together. The combat system, you know, it's a nice clever way to show that some actions take longer and some actions are immediate. Overall, really enjoy the combat in this game. Okay, that's it for my pros and cons. Let's go into my final thoughts. 
All right, here's the deal, guys. I could go on and on when reviewing a game like Point Blank. There's so much to the game. I could explain more of the systems. I could give you more pros and cons, but I think I've given you enough. So let me really wrap things up with a few final thoughts. You know, Point Blank, it's a lifestyle game. There's no getting around it. Although there's just the one core box, there's no expansions yet, anything like that. There's a lot here. It could be overwhelming at first glance. And for your first dozen hours of playing, you're going to be constantly referring to the 90 page rule book, you know, the multiple player aid cards. What does this icon mean? What are the difference between fire combat with firepower versus with ordnance? How is movement actually resolved? What are the steps with fatigue? What are the steps with um, being spotted? What, is, what are those line of sight rules again? Those I still haven't mastered. You're going to have to put some time in to learn this system. You know, Sean Drulinger and Lock and Load, they've, they've converted the detailed Lock and Load tactical hex, you know, hex encounter system from that hex encounter game to a card game. If you're familiar with that one, you will be familiar with this one and vice versa. Even watching videos from the guys over at Lock and Load, there's constant mention of this term will, from, will be familiar to Lock and Load tactical players. Along the way, they may have forgotten to simplify things a little or maybe ease the learning curve for new players, you know, leaving people a deep pool to jump into. Make no mistake, this is no kiddie pool either. You're going to have to swim or you will sink under the weight of this system. But if you take the time to learn the system, to become comfortable with the flow of the game, you are getting the richest, most detailed card-based war game I have ever played. The action card system of not knowing what actions you're able to take during a certain impulse, that back and forth card play, you know, waiting for a card to develop, waiting for, you know, movement to actually be taken care of, actually be um, conducted, the card-based terrain system, the leader and hero abilities, all of it, once learned, works together incredibly well. The game just flows. Now to continue the water analogy, it is a river, not a stream, so mind that current. You know, but if you can navigate that powerful current, wow, what an experience point blank can be. Something I want to address, I've been asked, I've seen the question myself, you know, I've, I've raised it myself. How does point blank compare to Warfighter? Besides the huge gameplay and system differences, which, you know, you will know if you've watched my overview of point blank, my gameplay, anyone's gameplay, the systems are nothing alike, right? The actual systems, how they work. I look at it this way. Warfighter is a really fun game, but it's just a game. Every aspect of Warfighter is abstracted. There's little or no real simulation value. It's a Hollywood action movie. Point Blank is a war documentary. It's looking to simulate squad battles and communicate the reality, right? The reality of limited time and actions shows men come fatigued, all maneuvering around and through a large battlefield made up of varying terrain. And if that's what you're looking for, Point Blank does a great job of it. All right, everybody. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed this review. Hope you enjoyed my other videos on the game. Please let me know what you think of my video and of this game in the comments below. Give me a like if you haven't. Subscribe if you haven't. Even if you only watch a couple of my videos, I really appreciate it. It helps me out. helps me to get more games to show off to you guys. So, all right. I think that's it for now. Until next time, everyone. Later.